Outsiders. Good morning and welcome to Outsiders, the show that is to woke virtue signalling and political correctness on steroids. What? The teals are to responsible adult government in this country. It's time these frauds and phonies were turfed out. Because make no mistake, in order to get a coalition government back into power and save us from the craziness of the Albanese clown show, we need to start by turfing out the teals. And whoever redubbed this teals ad from the last <laughs> election not only deserves a comedy award, if I was still in advertising, I'd give them a job today, but a medal for common sense and straight talking. Listen and enjoy. Are you yelling at the teals again? Are you frustrated with inner city lefties that have no idea how the real world works? Are you sick of smug like me talking down to you? Ever since the teals were elected, power prices have skyrocketed and your supermarket bill is through the roof. The solution is simple. Get rid of the teals and replace them with politicians who aren't idiots. Elect politicians who will take real action, like Matt Canavan, Barnaby Joyce, Lou O'Brien and Keith Pitt because they've always stood by coal and they'll always stand with you. Fantastic, great job. At the next election, let's make a meal out of the teals. In the meantime, let's grab the latest Outsiders news. So Rita and James, who'd have guessed a Labor government comes into power and the boats start re-arriving? Oh. Here they come, oh. open the floodgates. Now, let me tell you, you're either strong on borders or you're weak on borders. Guess what? Labor are always weak on borders. We will always see boat arrivals because in their heart and soul, that's what they want, Rita. It is. They'll say all the right things before an election. They'll tell us how strong they are on borders, how they're completely on board with these policies but we know where they stand. You know it's not in their DNA. It's not in their ideological makeup. And it's no coincidence that when Labor are in power, this becomes an issue. And second then boatload we've had arrived. We've now had second boatload come from Indonesia, uh, the, uh, the arrivals from places like Pakistan paying around $8,000 to people smugglers to get here. So that trade looks like it's being reignited again. And... This is a government that's just inept. It cannot deal with this issue. We've seen this week further revelations about the mishandling of the release of hardened criminals from yep. immigration detention. We're talking about murderers, rapists, serious criminals. And th they're just inept. They cannot deal with these issues because they don't really believe in it. This is not well, something they the care point. about. So, James, I wanted to make the point that... Um, uh, one wag on Twitter said, uh, I wonder if they got a welcome to country when they arrived up in the northern uh, uh, WA there. But this is the yeah, point. It's ideological. I mean, look, it, it is ideological, and it actually goes a lot deeper than just this one particular boat arrival. You oh, know, yeah. let's remember, we're going to talk about him a little bit later in the program, but Andrew Giles, the immigration minister, the thing that inspired him to get into politics, and he's the immigration minister, was being a legal advocate for the arrivals on the Tampa in 2001. So we've wow. come full circle. You'll remember that Christina Keneally, who almost won the seat of Fowler in Western Sydney and would have been the Home Affairs Minister in an Albanese government, she was against mandatory detention and had all sorts of meetings with refugee groups. You know, But the other thing, too, is that in Labour's DNA is not just about the refugees, but it's also about the big Australia massive migration program which is really bizarre to me because for labor, you would think that policies that drive down wages and drive the price of housing up would be totally, you know, not something that labor they would forgot, want to do for their constituency. Labor forgot the work a decade ago. Is the, this is it. But I think that this migration issue, Rowan and Rita, is exactly where Peter Dutton needs to be because this ties into so many things that people care about. Not just borders, but migration, the size of Australia, what our cities look like, density, many other issues we saw before in Dunkley. There's even fights where the Labour candidate in Dunkley is talking about, you know, we don't need really big towers. This is a big political issue. Labour is just sitting there waiting to be wedged if 
Peter Dutton decides to go and grab this issue and run it hard on all of the different things it has implications for. Well, we've already seen, Rita, uh, this ridiculous comment from the Prime Minister yesterday, or on the weekend, rather, when he was asked about, uh, about the fact that these new boat arrivals had been reported. Just have a listen to this extraordinary excuse. <sighs> Prime Minister, we're, we're hearing that an asylum seeker boat has arrived off to the Western Australian coastline. Do you know anything about that? Uh, I've been travelling in the car, uh, so I, I'm not, uh, I haven't been uh, advised about that. Uh, I've been oh, travelling in, in the, the car. car. I'm sorry, the mobile phone was invented, what, what 30 I, years I'm ago? Sorry. They were in before that for 20 years. I think you might have a radio in telephone cars. is there. I exactly. I'm in a car so I can't run the country, folks. We've got the biggest country, you know, one of the biggest countries on the planet, and you would hope you would spend a lot of time in the car. Uh, Obviously, he's so only... used to being in aeroplanes up the pointy end uh, that he's forgotten how to travel in a car and use a mobile. But can we not also note here that it's not like you and me travelling in a car and even if you and I were travelling in a car we probably would have taken a phone call uh, but he's got a driver he's in yes. the back seat so a being in a car, car is actually yeah. a perfect place <laughs> to be updated on precisely what has happened the fact that we've got after years of not this being an issue this becoming an issue again I mean it is an astonishing comment from a prime minister almost as good as his immigration minister Giles <laughs> asking Peter Dutton for the phone number or contact details of the well, grieving family member who he's failed to contact despite assuring us that he would contact. In Albo's defence, he may have been with Vodafone. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Well, let's have a look. Peter Dutton responded to that extraordinary bit of nonsense from the Prime Minister. Here we go. I think there are very significant issues when the Prime Minister of our country uh, is not even aware, hasn't received any briefing, uh, doesn't have the uh, protections put in place with surveillance mechanisms, etc., to pick up a boat uh, that arrives uh, on our shores, then it demonstrates that this government has lost control of our borders. And uh, Peter, not only lost control of our borders, they seem to have lost control of much else besides. Great reporting from James Morrow. Hang on, he's sitting right here. James Morrow, uh, during the week, uh, reported on the fact that uh, Albo managed to spend uh, only, donate $14 million to Food Bank, but managed to spend $40 million. Well, tell us what... Well, yeah, so this is really fascinating here. So, you know, at the time, we've got this sort of cost of living crisis here, Rowan. Um, it was revealed this week that Treasury has earmarked $40 million. Now, you know what it's for? It's to sell the stage three tax cut changes. So they said, oh, so we went to this, they're like, oh, well, it's about really, you know, keeping people informed about this in the same way that they did for other sort of tax changes. It's not true because 40 million is at the very top end of um, government ad campaigns. The other thing, too, though, that we've reported is that Treasury has taken out ads internally seeking Treasury bureaucrats to take communications jobs at up to 150 grand a year to help sell not just stage three, but, quote, other government priorities. Oh. So this, to me, says they are going to be using Treasury bureaucrats to sell government policies, not just on the stage three tax cuts, but also, I reckon there's stuff on negative gearing, capital gains tax, all coming down the pipe. So why, why would they need so much, Exactly. Why would they need so much money, as you said, other than to attack aspiration? But this is a start. This is using our money to sell us their yes. policies. This is just straight out political advertising to try to dress this up as a, some sort of an information campaign. Because at the end of the day, these tax cuts are applied. Uh, with that, whether you want them or not, whether you seek them or not, it's not like you need an information campaign because you have to fill out a form or Do apply something, for something. Yeah. No, this is something that will just hit your pay packet and some of you will get less than you were expecting because of the broken promise. Some of you get a little bit more. And that's it. So why do you need to have this messaging rammed down your throat at your expense when there's absolutely nothing for the Australians to do as far as the implement, implementation of this policy? And it'll be really policy? interesting to see what language they use because if they are using Treasury 
money and treasury bureaucrats to mirror, you know, that sort of government language around, oh, you know, it's about fairness and this and that. You know, th this is just blatantly political. It's political and advertising, and which is a disgrace, yeah. absolutely. But, uh, of course, Labor loves spending your money. No one spends it quite like Labor and as enthusiastically and as recklessly. Um, we heard about these uh, $707 million, OK, uh, going towards creating... 3,000 jobs for Indigenous people in remote Australia. Well, there might be a few jobs coming up in the top end there to help all those arrivals get ashore. Maybe there's a few jobs there. Um, the uh, minister responsible for this is Malandiri McCarthy. Um, she, uh, there doesn't seem to be any accountability here. It just seems to be there will be 3,000 jobs. This is bizarre Pete, because... Peter Dutton has said, uh, well, you know, what are the specifics? Uh, they don't seem to be any, James. Well, it's pretty bizarre because, <laughs> you know, just doing some back-of-the-envelope calculations here, they're going to spend $707 million to create 3,000 jobs. That's more than $200,000 a job. Yeah, exactly. And we don't know what these jobs are for. We don't know whether... Are these salaries going to be paid for by the government? Are they on the payroll? Are they adding any productivity to the economy? Are they doing anything to really properly integrate people in remote communities into the broader Australian community, which, of course, is what has to happen if there's going to be real opportunity and not just shoveling money at people. This Reason? is just well, absolutely a disgrace. Well, yeah, we need details, just like The Voice. We need details. <laughs> oh. That's where that's, they seem to be hesitant to come forward with because... The last thing we need is another bureaucracy in this area. We actually need meaningful change, jobs that uh, produce improvements and add to the community, not just one way of taking uh, public money and, and putting it somewhere else uh, and, and losing a percentage of it through the bureaucracy. That seems to be what this government is expert at, taking our money, <laughs> spending it in areas, you with, know, with minus... No, nothing to show for it at the <laughs> end of that. Rita, I'm glad you mentioned The Voice because uh, Malandiri McCarthy, who's in charge of this particular program, $707 million of your dollars going to create... 3,000 jobs, as James says, at over quarter, around a quarter of a million a pop for those jobs. Uh, let's have a listen to Malandiri McCarthy as she uh, wrapped up her uh, advocacy for The Voice and the priorities that The Voice would be looking at uh, during The Voice campaign, oh, yes. during the failed oh. referendum. Let's just remind ourselves of her priorities. This is an opportunity, my fellow Australians, just like we see the opportunity on our future here, we see that the totems of the kangaroo and the emu are really important. The totems of the kangaroos and the emus are really important. She, well, she that's great. She speak can... for a very short period there, you know. <laughs> that was the debate with uh, Senator Price, Jacinta Price, and... Uh, Jacinta Price knew what she wanted to say and, and that's she why said the it people very voted clearly. For, they voted against the voice and yet this government, the Albanese government, is completely ignoring the plebiscite, uh, the referendum, sorry, completely ignoring your vote and the 61% of Australians who voted against the voice and just ploughing on ahead, spending money, more bureaucracies, as Rita was saying, uh, and we know that there will be very little to show for it. We've got a... Uh, uh, Rita, you drew my attention to this story as well, that... Uh, we are now going to be choosing our judges. Our legal mm. system is going to include diversity and inclusion. Discredited, by the way, all around the world increasingly, diversity and inclusion. Everybody is seeing the failures of this system. We saw the Claudine Gay scandal with Harvard. We've seen endless examples of how this diversity and inclusion stuff is absolute poison. Now we're going to have it inserted into our legal system, Rita. Mm. This is terrifying. It is. It's, they're going to focus on things like cultural awareness and, and diversity and away from what they call the traditional view of merit. So forget about most uh, well-equipped to deal with a, with a role, uh, most qualified, most accomplished. No, that their traditional views of merit. And what about their cultural background? What about their diversity? What boxes are they ticking? I mean, is that really what we want well, in our justice system? Our justice system is already, if you ask me, corrupted totally. by too many yep. left-leaning ideologues who... And, you know, there's no surprise that we keep hearing about cases where you scratch your head going, how did that person get bail? How did they get such a ridiculously lenient sentence for such a heinous crime? Well, because these judges have been appointed and now they seem to be even more uh, ultra-focused on these things. And remember, once a judge is appointed, it is a job for life. They cannot be removed unless there is some 
mass uh, wrongdoing, but you and, know, and they, they can make... So, but Rowan, let's, Rita, I mean, let's, let's not forget yeah. quickly on that, that during The Voice, one of the uh, justices or judges or whatever came out and was saying it was racist. Mm. For all Australians who opposed The Voice, 61%, they were racist. So that's right. the just that's, that's right. the woke justicism. That's what you're in for. You go expecting the law, James, to give you a fair well, go, balanced law, blind justice. Nah, it's woke justice coming to Australia. It's already here, but it's gonna get Can worse. I just point out too, I mean, the incredible hypocrisy here behind this. The you know, as if first of all that the court system isn't biased far <laughs> enough exactly. to the left already. Let's yeah. just put that to the side. Everybody out there will have cases that they know of and that they're thinking of the things. That's just I mean, I can't believe that, that ever got up. But what the message is saying here, this is such a divisive message because the message that they are saying here is that, sure, we're all Australians, but your race matters, your culture matters, your background matters, and so you cannot necessarily sit in judgment of somebody else in the court via the common law, via our judicial system, if you're from a different background. That is where this yep. all leads. And so think about the cases that can then be appealed. If, let's say, a white justice gives a harsher sentence or what a, a criminal says is too harsh a sentence for somebody from another background, they can say, oh, well, they must have been biased against me because they didn't appreciate my diversity my and my culture. And then that becomes an excuse and this is going to tear the country apart, just like The Voice was going to, as soon as you inject that racist division and say that only people of different races can get together and have the same views about things, society is divided, falls apart. There was a Absolutely. fantastic piece in the Oz uh, on the weekend yesterday um, by Jared Henderson on this issue, but mm. focusing on Victoria. I think the headline was Victoria's shame, police and justice system broken, and he quotes... Uh, eminent people, including King's councils, who are saying this justice system has been so corrupted that public faith has been shaken to the core. And it, and it has, because we have seen case after case where you have the unequal application of the law, where you've got these uh, double standards that are glaring. And if people don't trust their justice system, then you're on a very ugly path. Mm, and we're absolutely. seeing in the US with the most ridiculous judgment <laughs> yes. against we'll Trump. We'll talk about that we'll a bit later on. Yeah. Well, we will, but about like the, the, the fact that any judge could base a ruling on thinking Mar-a-Lago is worth 18 mm -hmm. million, this, what, 18 acres of beachfront land on with a 104-room mansion. I mean, it is the most insane premise but we get, we don't, we're nowhere near that. I'm not suggesting we're in, we're in that category, but it is just a dangerous road to be down. You, everyone should feel like if you go before the courts, regardless of who you are, what your politics are, you get a fair hearing. Yeah, but Australia, we're already seeing the corruption with the... Well, corruption, I don't know whether it's just incompetence, maybe. We're talking about this Andrew Giles character who's the Immigration Minister, James. Uh, this, we've released into the community now, what is it... Um, let me read it out to you. Uh, seven individuals convicted of murder or attempted murder, 37 sex offenders, including pedophiles, another 72 individuals convicted of assault and violent offending, kid and kidnapping... And a number of them... And a number Just of released, them. there you go, onto the community. And, you know, what a, could go wrong? And a number of them have been re-arrested for a whole variety <laughs> of claims, including one, of them, including one of them who did a Sam Brinton and went to Melbourne Airport and just started stealing luggage off the carousel. Nice. So that's great. But then... You know, remember, all of this stuff here, this is exactly as we said it was going to be. There's another case that could lead to further releases of detainees. But this is, again, this is the labor DNA when yep. it comes to, uh, to migration, when it comes to refugees. And they assume that, oh, well, you know, it, it, this is all fine. But the thing is, Andrew Giles, they knew this case was coming down. And wow. this week it came out, this week it came out that while home affairs lawyers and immigration department staff and his office was taking briefings from the Australian Solicitor General saying, hey, look, this case is not going to go our way and we need to have some sort of plan and preparation for it. And that's why Peter Dutton was able to push that legislation through and force Labor to join them. Andrew Giles was off doing voice events. And he was in yep. London at that event at the um, uh, High, at the, um, high Commission in London. You remember that, the drag queen the drag singing, singing drag John Farnham yeah. songs. And he was, yeah. and he was mm. out the front of Parliament House uh, at some other event. And, you know, like, 
this just shows where his priorities mm -hmm. and the government's right. So it's all about the voice. It's not about your voice not to have criminals who've come here illegally released out on the street. That voice doesn't count. It's the other voice. We're in the grip of a crazy, hardcore left-wing government. Uh, incompetence, oh, no, idiocy and ideology abound. Uh, but that uh, can't be right, because remember, <laughs> Albo was on the front page of the paper saying, I'm not woke, I'm, I'm a centrist. So <laughs> I refuse to believe the evidence before me. It cannot be real. Uh, now let's take a little bit of net zany, the crazy world of climate change policies. And what a surprise, a Newcastle Steelworks forced to close. Uh, we're going to see more of this as we set about deindustrializing our nation, uh, returning ourselves probably to, uh, to, to the Stone Age as we get rid of this. everything that makes us prosperous and safe. This is a, um, this is actually really, it's more than just an environmental issue and a jobs issue. This is a national security issue, right? Yes. Because totally. if a country cannot make its own steel, then it cannot make its own weapons, it cannot defend itself. Literally, this is allowing our sovereignty, and I don't use that word lightly, our sovereignty and our ability to remain a sovereign nation in a very dangerous neighborhood, an increasingly dangerous neighborhood, becomes that much more difficult every time you let something like this go. You know, oh, but we're going to help the planet. Well, I'm sorry, I'd rather save Australia. Exactly. Well, um, anybody who, you know, criticises us for criticising the climate cult for their craziness, uh, well, what about this one? They're going to use hair now in jumpers in order to save the planet. That's right, hair. Uh, this is the latest mad, crazy climate change idea. Let's use human hair in jumpers because that will save the planet. These people are completely insane. And if you want the evidence, here's one climate cultist wandering around, uh, I think he was in the States somewhere, screeching at the top of his head. This is what climate alarmism has done to an entire generation. Have a look. Is under attack, wildfires, storms, drought, hurricanes. The climate crisis is here, and Biden has the power to do something about it. All we're asking is that he use the tools at his disposal. I'm putting my life on the line, the body, my body on the line, and all we're asking is that he declare a climate emergency. Entire Deranged. generation. But I don't blame that kid. He's the, he's the victim Come of on. the education system, of parents who buy into the climate cult, of politicians who won't stand up and oppose the climate cult, of churches, of businesses, of jobs, of shops that pander to this garbage, knowing full well they're doing it only for their own uh, profits or virtue signalling, and you're mentally affecting an entire generation of kids like that, Rita. Well, yes, climate anxiety is on the rise and it doesn't always present yeah. itself like that sort of deranged uh, outburst where they've got these delusions of grandeur almost. I'm putting my a, body on the line. I'm putting my life on the line. They think they're saving the earth. I mean, this is the most privileged uh, generation ever. They have never had it so good when it comes to uh, prosperity, to opportunity, to, to uh, living a long and healthy life. Everything is in their favour and yet we've probably never had a more depressed generation uh, mm. who, who need medication, who need a psychological help because we have inflicted these anxieties on them uh, based often on nothing. Now, they think the world's ending. They I think know. they have it's no future. Tragic. It's tragic. Well, James, I was amused to see that the FDA in the States <laughs> have approved a frostbite drug. Why would you need a frostbite it's drug, warming. I wonder? Uh, when we've got global boiling. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's strange anyway. But just as well, somewhere they might need the frostbite drug is in China, where this week temperatures plummeted from minus 1 to minus 40 degrees. Doesn't sound like much global boiling happening over there in China. In <laughs> fact, Rita, you mm. sent me this. An outsider's fan called Coco complained that this is 7 a.m. on Thursday, the 15th of February 2024, in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. Global warming at its best, nine degrees, well, summer. <laughs> that's just what's happening too now, where you have a hot day in summer in Australia. It's apparently notable as, as a sign of uh, impending doom and uh, how can we possibly cope with these extreme temperatures. Having temperatures in the mid to high 30s in Australia in summer is not ex is not notable, but these days, I mean, it happens, and they lead the news with it. Well, it's so nobody, nobody has any memory at all of no. these sorts of things. I mean, <laughs> I, 
uh, you know, I haven't gone back and looked at the numbers, but I'll go back and look at the numbers after the show. I would love to look at the number of 40-degree days we've had in Sydney this summer. And I think we've had Hard, maybe one, hardly. maybe two. But, you know, four or five years ago, I remember whole weeks where you were up touching 40. So, come on, just relax. It's summer. It's Australia. <laughs> and if you, thought, if you thought using human hair in jumpers was crazy, Chris Bowen's come up with an even crazier one. They're going to put the prices of our utes that our tradies in Australia, oh, the backbone of the Australian farming communities, regional Australia, tradies, etc. Bowen is going to jack up the price of utes, the Can great Australian utes. Please do. Because, so, you know, Matt Canavan, great friend of this program, did a really excellent analysis on this. Um, and what he has done, he's exposed the lie. The government keeps lying to you and saying, hey, look, our new emission standards... They're just about giving you more choice so you can have a, more choice for low emissions vehicles and EVs. There's nothing stopping car makers from selling you those low emissions vehicles and EVs. Now, the rules are that they're imposing are going to ratchet up the cost of things that you want to buy. A Ford Ranger Ute by 2029 will be nine to ten thousand dollars more expensive. That's one of Australia's most popular cars. Australia is not Belgium, it's not the mm. Netherlands, it's not this tiny little country. People need to drive long distances, they need to tow things, and they are going to make it more difficult for people and tradies to do what they want to do and force them into things that don't have the towing capacity and the power, and they're going to do it by restricting choice and driving these things out of the market and out of your range of affordability. Uh, That's the big uh, lie of what Chris Bowen is saying. Absolutely. Do not believe him. Well, of course, and, and consumers are telling us what they want. Correct. Uh, this, it, it's, even if the EV options were as good as the, the traditional vehicles, it should be up to the consumer to of decide. Course, you should not be bullied into making a pick that you don't want to pick because of the exorbitant cost of the, the extra taxes. And I just... I, Absolutely. But you know what? People are making choices. We're seeing car rental companies dumping their EVs yep. or reducing 100%. their yep. EVs Investors because... Investors are getting out of them. They people don't even renting them don't want them, let yeah. alone people who are driving them they, day they in, day out. They don't do the job that Australians tradies, Australia's tradies and farmers and workers in regional Australia need. If you're a tradie, if you're a worker in regional or farming communities in Australia, you need to wake up very, very quickly and tell your mates and tell your customers that labour are going to destroy your business. That's what they're setting out to do. This sort of nonsense is just destroys the backbone of this country. Jacking up the price of you, give me a break. How un-Australian can you get? Coming up, a break. We've got a short break and then Rita's reality check. What's more coming up on the show in a tip. You're watching Outsiders with your hosts, Rowan Dean, James Morrow, and I'm Rita Panahi. And before we look at the Albanese government's ongoing race obsessions, let's take a moment to check in with the Veep, Vice President Kamala Harris, who has, well, she appears bored these days with politics. She's uh, trying her hand at stand-up comedy. President Biden and I have demonstrated there is a smarter way. Uh, that wasn't her comedy. That wasn't the comedy routine. But uh, don't worry, I'll bring you that later in the program because she kills me. She is getting <laughs> very, very good indeed. She was talking about just how uh, much better her and Biden are than previous politicians. Apparently, they've just set a new path that, like, we've never seen before. And, and the president's also been eager to show just how well they're going. The man has never been more coherent and clear on his vision for the nation. I guess I should clear my mind here a little bit. Yes, yes, <laughs> he really should clear it. Um, but good news, after 378 days, President has finally made it to East Palestine, Ohio. That's 378 days after a toxic train derailment and fire that sent poisonous fumes into the air. And, gosh, it was worth the wait. Biden was as sharp as ever. On date, on, on, on date of breaks that meet higher safety standards, I can already see this derailment won't define you. It just uh, it defines you in a different way. 
it won't mm. define you, but it does define you in a different way. That's good to know. Oh. And right before Biden left for Ohio, he scolded the White House for having a two-week recess. How dare they go on a break? Instead of going on a two-week vacation, two weeks, they're walking away. Two weeks. What are they thinking? My God, this is bizarre. <laughs> The pure chutzpah of this guy is amazing. Railing against a two-week vacation from a president who has spent around 40% of his presidency on vacation. Yes, Biden hasn't just broken records for illegal immigration. He's also breaking records for number of vacation days on personal overnight trips away from the White House. When you hear him speak these days, though, you can see why he needs the rest and relaxation. You can also see why they are trying to put his biggest political rival in jail on trumped-up charges because no amount of mail-in voting and zuckerbucks is going to save Joe in 2024. Now to the Albanese government, and it is uh, increasingly clear that this is an unserious government full of unserious people who are better suited to activism and culture wars than governing. In the past week, we have seen illegal boats arriving again. We've seen further details on how utterly inept multiple ministers have been in dealing with the release of hardened criminals from immigration detention. And we had the bad news that the unemployment rate has jumped to a two-year high of 4.1%. And in the midst of all that, we still have the Prime Minister pushing for treaty and so-called truth-telling. And we had this startling update from Indigenous Australians Minister Linda Burney. The issue of truth-telling is incredibly uh, important uh, and uh, there are many, many ways in which that can happen, including school curriculum. Yes, the Albanese government appears hell-bent on defying the will of the Australian people and pressing ahead with a divisive race-based agenda. Remember the Uluru Statement? The voice was to be step one, followed by so-called truth-telling and then Makarata or treaty. And now they want elements of that in the school curriculum. It's frankly hard to think of a more daft idea than corrupting the curriculum further with political dogma and historical racial grievances. What we've seen this week is just further proof that this is a government not fit for office, a government of hard-left activists and pretenders who prefer culture wars to governing. Fantastic, Rita. Yes, isn't it extraordinary? The Albanese government completely ignoring the will of the Australian people in the referendum last year and ploughing ahead. They, the only way to stop them is to vote them out, as I keep saying. Um, now, concerns around China continue to grow as it becomes increasingly evident that that superpower is uh, readying itself for uh, military expansion, if you like. Joining us now to discuss this, as well as the Indonesian presidential election this, uh, this week, which was... Uh, Pretty fascinating result. Joining us is Andrew Phelan, former DFAT Australia China Council scholar. Have a go. Here we go. Andrew, great to see you again. So, um, so. Now tell us, tell us what. Let's get on to China in a second. But I want to hear your thoughts on the Indonesian presidential election. So this uh, character is an ex-military guy. Is that a good thing for Australia or a bad thing? Yeah, the, you're quite right, Rowan. The uh, Selamat Pagi, everyone in Indonesian. Good morning. Um, it's uh, been a fascinating process. Uh, Prabowo Subianto is an ex Kopassus uh, Special Forces uh, general, and he sort of got one foot in the Suharto era, era, which was more of a military dictatorship. Indonesia's changed so much since then. And he, he was the first over the line in a three-horse race against two other candidates, Anis Peswaden, who was the mayor of uh, Jakarta, former education minister, academic, um, very personable. All three of these uh, candidates speak very good English. Uh, Ganja Pranowo, the other um, uh, guy that was running for president, was the uh, mayor of uh, uh, Central Java. And uh, both he and Beswaden were out in front of the COVID pandemic. Um, Pranowo was on his bicycle. Both those two had a little bit of controversy around them, around the, the political football uh, that of uh, using Islam for political reasons. Um, 
The mayor of Jakarta booted out a, a Chinese Christian mayor um, on a blasphemy charge. And the other guy um, was the guy that banned uh, an Israeli soccer team from playing in a Youth ah, World Cup. So literally that. a political football and a known gold. But back to Prabowo, to get around his um, the downside of his past, he ran a brilliant campaign bringing in Jokowi, the outgoing president's son, who's 36 years old. And if I, if I think of myself uh, at 36, I hope um, Gibran Rakabuming Raka is his name, is uh, a bit more uh, switched on than I was when I was 36. But he wasn't allowed to run at that age. Um, so there was a court case. You had to be 40. Uh, so they found a loophole. It helped the fact that uh, his that the judge um, was a, a relative. Um, he's since had to resign because of that decision. But nonetheless, they found a loophole to bring Jokowi's son. So Jokowi, the outgoing uh, president's shadow, has really loomed over this election. Mm. Prabowo, what will he do? Um, he's got a bit of a reputation for a fits of pique and anger. Um, he, at the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore a year or so ago, unannounced he, um, uh, to, to his uh, colleagues, the president, the foreign minister, he um, talked about a peace plan for Ukraine, which was applauded by China. Um, and so that was a bit of a surprise. But I think from an Australian perspective, and he's got Catholics and Protestants in his family, um, it'll be continuity so, with the Jokowi era. Uh, Jokowi had a reputation uh, for infrastructure. Yep. Andrew, I wanted to sort of jump in here and move to the, sorry, to, to the yep. other big topic, of course, here which is yep. China. And I want to get your take on this because, you know, on the one hand, the Albanese government has said, oh, you know, we've made things more stable now with China. On the other hand, we've seen an awful lot of aggression from China, um, weird incidents like the sonar ping um, and, uh, and other yep. sorts of things. Um, are relations with China back on track or has Albo made a meal of this? Um, you know, I, I usually say we should think of China holistically. I'm going to make an exception in this case. We know that China's facing a lot of headwinds. We've got the real estate crisis. Real estate was 25% of the economy. Um, uh, trillions, trillions have been wiped off the stock market and the local government debt's in trillions and the economy's slowing. It's got a demographic time bomb. However, today, China uh, manufactures the next nine global manufacturers combined output put together. So it is the sole manufacturing superpower. Uh, at the turn of the century, the US made about twice as much goods as China. By 2008, China had caught up. Today, it's about 2x the size of the US. And what it's doing now is it's focusing on its strength. So there's kind of two Chinas, if you like. So the manufacturing powerhouses doubling down on what it's good at. Electric vehicles, batteries, uh, shipbuilding. They now produce 50% of the world's new ship tonnage. And they are exporting EVs hand over fist. They're making new car carriers. BYD, for example, which overtook uh, Tesla in uh, volume in, in Q4 last year, um, has uh, just um, uh, had a, a 7,000 vehicle roll-on, roll-off um, car carrier go to Europe. They're planning seven more. And I should add that the Chinese Navy added uh, seven hulls in the last year. We can't even crew our puny Navy. And why this is not an absolute emergency and why we're not seeing ads for naval recruitment on the TV mm. is beyond me. So the, the, an essay that's been doing the rounds in the last week in the US is how, how primed is China for war? The other thing is whether um, China attacks Taiwan, it's bumping against uh, uh, Philippine vessels in the Philippines. That's another, in the uh, West Philippine Sea, that's another flashpoint. Um, whether uh, they, they actually go to war is beside the point. The fact is they're mobilising for war and we need to pre prepare accordingly should that eventuate. Well, uh, I'm not quite sure we have the government in place to do that, but you never know. Another reason we need a coalition government just, in just, there. Just, just, <laughs> yes. Sorry, Andrew, quickly. Just a fi final, point, Ro Ro final point before I go, Rowan. Um, China and Indonesia are sort of converging in the production of nickel, uh, in Indonesia, which is dirty, uh, poor, poor labour and environmental standards, very dangerous. And so we ought to be asking the question about the EV that's parked in your driveway. How good for the planet is that EV when the cobalt's coming from Congo, the rare earths which China's weaponising are coming from uh, the Kansas mm. City and Inner Mongolia, uh, Chilean copper that's fired by coal-fired power? Uh, and so on. You know, these are some. These are things that the teals, the greens, 
and Labor are not talking about, and they should be. Fantastic, 100%. Andrew Phelan, thanks so much for coming on Outsiders, and we'll see you again soon. Coming up right in a moment, you know, after our break, it's Claire Chandler, Senator Claire Chandler, with amazing things she's been up to. You want to hear this, don't go away. Back in a tick. You're watching Outsiders with Rita Panahi, with James Morrow and myself, Rowan Dean. And thank you so much for watching us every Sunday morning. We certainly do appreciate it. Well, as you know, we've talked a lot about UNWAR, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, for years on this program. We've been warning about their links to terrorist activities. We've repeatedly brought this up. It's been raised in Parliament. It was raised... Uh, uh, Julie Bishop re reversed some $10 million of funding to UNRWA thanks to this show and people like David Adler, Pauline Hanson, David Lionhelm and, and others, Erica Betts. Now, more shocking developments as we've ca ca covered over the last couple of weeks. Well, someone who's taken the fight to the floor of Parliament is, of course, Senator Claire Chandler from Tasmania, and she was asking some terrific questions this week of DFAT and the funding of UNWAR. So, Claire, great to have you back on Outsiders, as always. Thanks for the great job you do. Um, now, you were asking DFAT specifically about, and it's a little bit complicated, but my understanding is that 20% of the payment to UNWAR, based on normal compliance requirements, uh, required them to check whether that money was going in any way towards terrorism. They didn't bother with that this time round. They just funneled through all the money, didn't even bother doing that, and only a few weeks later, October 7th, occurred. Is that a good summation? And then tell us what you were asking them in Parliament. That's a, a very good summation, yes, Rowan. So this week in Senate estimates, uh, I was asking questions of the Department of Foreign Affairs about the um, logistics of the contract that we have in place to fund UNRWA. And like you say, in prior years, 20% of that total $20 million payment has been withheld so that the department can do the compliance checks and make sure that UNRWA mm -hmm. isn't um, undertaking, you know, uh, terrorist activity or, or anything like this. Now, we found out this week at Estimates that those compliance checks didn't take place this year, that the department pushed the entire $20 million out the door in one fell swoop. And like you say, just a few weeks after that, we saw what was happening with the 7th of October terrorist attacks. Now, I think we need to be very clear here that not one cent of Australian taxpayer funding should be going to an organisation which has staff supporting Hamas or supporting terrorism. And we now know that that is the situation that UNRWA is in. So I think it's very disappointing that the government waived these contractual obligations this year um, and particularly in light of what has happened since then, it's pretty disappointing. James. And, I mean, I think we should note, uh, Senator, that uh, recently the Israeli forces blew up an UNRWA building that had a link down to a Hamas tunnel where there was all of the computer servers and they were being supplied with UNRWA electricity. But what was the answer that you got from DFAT about why they had decided to process this payment, to send these taxpayer funds to UNRWA, despite the check? And is there a ongoing issue where DFAT itself is institutionally biased in favour of, mm. of Palestine? Mm. Well, look, I, I think that's a very good question, James. I mean, the response from the department that I had when I asked why were these obligations raised, why didn't you withhold the 20% payment and undertake your checks and balances this year was, well, the situation in Gaza was, was so dire um, and we were satisfied that nothing was going to go too badly wrong, so we were happy to put the money out the door. Now, uh, I think that's a pretty hard pill to swallow when you consider the fact that just a few weeks after that um, we were in October 7 and, and you know, the, the situation was unfolding in the Middle East as it currently was. So um, whether or not DFAT is uh, captured to any one view, I certainly think that they should have been doing those checks and balances before they released the full $20 million to UNRWA this year. Uh, and like I say, the fact that the situation in the Middle East escalated so rapidly just a few weeks after proves that there is a very good and genuine reason why those checks and balances are built into the contract that the government has with them. Um, Claire, Hillel Neuer, who uh, does great work for UN Watch, um, he's alleging that uh, for 10 years uh, they've been sending warnings mm. to DFAT, uh, as so has this program, so we can vouch for that. Uh, and he's accusing 
uh, certain individuals at DFATS of shielding UNWA, and uh, he's actually accusing them of lying to you uh, in some of their answers in the Senate. So we should keep an eye on that. Um, but let's talk now, uh, Claire, about uh, something else that you've been such a strong politician on, so many Australian girls in particular should be thanking you for, uh, is this whole transgender issue. We now learn that there's gender care for three-year-olds at Melbourne's Royal Children's Hospital. Gender-affirming care for children as young as three. What do you make of this, Claire? Oh, I, I think it's absolutely crazy that this is happening in Australia while everywhere else in the world the ways in which uh, children with gender dysphoria are being treated is under the microscope and being reviewed consistently. And in many instances, the gender affirming model, um, the model that by which a, a child's gender identity is affirmed rather than um, their biological sex, this model is being rolled back in uh, other jurisdictions overseas because there have been independent reviews, there have been inquiries, and they have found that these models aren't necessarily providing the best possible outcomes to young children. So once again, I find it absolutely staggering that we are living in a country where frankly, people have their heads in the sand about this. No one wants to be looking at this issue. No one wants to be talking about this issue. Mm. Whereas we know overseas when there have been inquiries and there have been reviews, these these affirmative care models aren't working. Oh, it's crazy to have three-year-olds, three-year-olds involved in this. Uh, I think Australia is an outlier now with the rest of the world. The rest of the world's uh, smartening up. I want to just ask you quickly about taxpayer dollars going to some characters who are doxing Jewish people, who are circulating lists of Jews who are then getting all sorts of harassment and hate. And some of these characters responsible for the doxing, we find out, are the beneficiary of taxpayer-funded grants. Is that something that you're comfortable with? Look, certainly if there is uh, taxpayer money that's being spent on these events and these individuals, then um, like all expenditure of taxpayer funding, I think that should be reviewed and very carefully examined. But I think the broader issue here, and we've seen this playing out consistently over the last four or five months since the 7th of October attacks, is the way that um, certain elements of the left in this country are happy to, to reward uh people who are, you know, undertaking uh, or, or, or um, promoting, I should say, anti-Semitic views. In fact, I think it's arguably become trendy and popular within some elements of the left to, to have these views and to put them out on social media and you see people getting rewarded for that. And I think that's a massive, massive problem. There is no place for anti-Semitism in this country and we should be calling it out where we see it and not rewarding people for um, having those views to start with. 100%. Senator Claire Chandler, always great to chat to you. Thanks so much for coming on Outsiders and the great work you do in Parliament. Let's grab a little bit of Wackademia. Ooh. Ooh. James, uh, just what Claire was talking about, anti-Semitism being injected into educational institutions. This is in America. Tell this us is about wild. It. In Washington State, so up in the Pacific Northwest, um, just north of Oregon and the, all of the Antifa people in Portland and also home to Seattle, of course, where we had all that Antifa stuff a couple of years ago. So lawmakers wanted to very reasonably put in laws to ensure that the Holocaust was properly taught in schools. The whole idea, never again. This not, does not happen again about anti-Semitism and telling people about the real unique horror that was the Holocaust. So what did they do? Well, Democrats decided to go to the state legislature and introduce a Hamas amendment. They want <laughs> to teach from the Hamas perspective to address, quote, anti-Israel bias in um. the curriculum. This is as nuts as saying, well, you know, Maybe we should teach, I don't know, World War II from the Nazi perspective. It's, you know, kind of, we won't just want to have a bit of balance there. I mean, it's just, this is where the left is. They are taking the sides of America's enemies in their quest to push Jew hatred. There's no other way to put it. Absolutely. And let me just, on, on something James just said there, never again. There is a rally today in Sydney. Yes. Uh, 3 p.m. this afternoon. Go onto the website. Never again is now. 
We had Freya Leach on, she was on Rita's show as well, talking about how important this protest is, this rally in support of Israel, never again is now. Go to the website and, uh, and that's at three o'clock this afternoon in Sydney. Uh, there was also a pro-Palestine Harvard students and the oh, actress Cynthia hilarious. Nixon, oh, Rita, uh, took part in a hunger strike. This well, is one of those of. Sex in the City girls. Yes, yeah, she's women. the redhead you'd remember. Um, this is... Calling it a hunger strike perhaps is overselling it. They're, they're, call, they're calling it a hunger strike, but guess how many hours per day this hunger strike lasts for? 12. So 12, <laughs> like people who do intermittent fasting <laughs> would fast for 16 to 18 hours a day. But for these, no, no, this is heroic, uh, heroic. Were they precious. sleeping for eight of those hours? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably. Uh, Cynthia, uh, I suppose, is going to do it for five days. She lasted two, so uh, she... Uh, a, yeah, yeah the commitment to the cause exactly. is inspiring. Wow. Yeah. Until yeah. lunch is ready. Yep. Um, <laughs> also, uh, briefly, indigenizing university maths. So the Canadian mathematical community has now decided, like we've tried to do here, make uh, indigenous uh, elements are now part of the maths course, apparently. Uh, in so indigenous two plus two does not equal four. And apparently not. That's colonialism. Exactly, colonialism. that's colonialism. So uh, <laughs> unbelievable. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, uh, lots more to talk about. Lots more guests coming up. Some very impressive ones. You don't want to go away. We'll see you in a tick. Hello, you're watching Outsiders with Rita Nightcap Panahi, oh. James Friday on my mind for the US report tomorrow, and myself Rowan, easy like Sunday morning Dean. Back in 2018, Outsiders was not only on Sunday mornings, but also at 11 p.m. on weeknights. I am thrilled to say that in that 11 p.m. to midnight time slot, there is finally a worthy successor <laughs> with the wonderful Rita Panahi show, now running 11 p.m. four nights a week, Monday to Thursday. And I urge Outsiders fans to tune in on the dot of 11 p.m. Don't miss a second of it. Nobody does it better than Rita. And nobody puts the show together quite like Rita Panahi. But I was thinking about those late night shows we did when the battle against wokeness and cancel culture was first heating up. And I'm pleased to say we were at the vanguard of it as was one of our late night guests. Here on Outsiders, we have made it a habit of introducing you to the rising conservative stars and thinkers of the future long, long before they become regulars on all the other TV shows. One such was an unknown and wet behind the ears British stand-up comedian, who back then in 2018 had been all over social media one day because he had refused to sign a ridiculously woke behavioural agreement before performing his comedy act at the University of London. This pre-performance censorship form had demanded a whole raft of topics that were basically off limits. Well, as we know, good comedy is all about poking fun, which by definition can be viewed as disrespectful by anyone eager to take offence, which is of course what always happens. The full list of these quasi-taboo topics listed by the organisers of this particular event were, wait for it, racism, sexism, classism, ageism, ableism, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, xenophobia, Islamophobia, or anti-religion or anti-atheism. Hmm, interesting. I note anti-Semitism didn't make the cut. Anyway, I'll get back to that in a tick with our next guest. But the reality is there isn't a single funny joke in the lexicon of Anglo-Saxon humour that doesn't breach at least one of those guidelines, if not several. What a farce. When that young comedian saw the behavioural agreement that he was supposed to sign before going on to perform, he said, it nearly made me puke. This was, of course, right at the heart of the whole cancel culture, political correctness, epidemics sweeping across Western democracies and universities. So naturally, we were keen to find out who this brave, young comedian was for daring to stare down woke. Well, after initially being reluctant, he agreed to come on our show late, 11pm at night, same time as Rita had Panicky's show now, on, in December 2018, and we had a long interview with him. What was interesting was that we quickly learned that he wasn't politically of the right or a conservative as such. In fact, he espoused to many of the standard leftists' young beliefs, and he was adamant that he'd never make racist, sexist or whatever jokes anyway. So what had made him arc up where so many other comedians meekly 
complied with this sort of Orwellian nonsense? Well, the reason is he was an immigrant to Britain who'd been born in the Soviet Union and who had seen and whose parents had seen this sort of oppressive censorship and political correctness. And they'd fled to England to escape it. And now here it was rearing its head. Many, many migrants in Australia feel exactly the same way, by the way, particularly those who fled China and other places. Well, early last year, this same young man spoke at the Oxford Union student debate and savaged the woke students there with a scathing rebuke of wokeness and in particular climate change ideology. Overnight, he became an international star of conservative politics. We sit on this side of the house because we know that the way to improve the world is to work, is to create, it is to build. And the problem with woke culture is that it's trained too many young minds like yours to forget about that. Thank you very much. Since then, this comedian has gone from strength to strength and is now one of the world's leading warriors in the battle against woke. His name is Konstantin Kizan, and now he runs one of the most popular political podcasts in the world, Trigonometry. And the good news is he's coming out to Australia. Indeed, he will be here on Outsiders next Sunday morning. Two of Australia's most prestigi prestigious think tanks, the CIS, the Centre for Independent Studies here in Sydney, and the IPA, the Institute for Public Affairs in Melbourne, have teamed up to bring Constantin Kizan out here, and you can get tickets to see and hear him in person. Tuesday, Feb 27th in Perth, Wednesday, Feb 28th in Melbourne, and then Wednesday, March 6th here in Sydney. So make sure you get in early and book your tickets, because I promise you, you're in for a real treat. Of course, we're already seeing the absolutely poisonous effect of woke culture within our schools and universities on a daily basis. You're paying much higher energy bills than you need to thanks to woke. You are paying higher prices at the supermarket <coughs> thanks to woke. Your children are entering a world of sexual confusion and disorientation thanks to woke. Many young women will have their breasts chopped off and many young men will be castrated because of woke. We used to call that barbaric savagery and mutilation. Now it's called gender affirmation. Families are being driven apart because of woke. Hard-working white males and white females and heterosexuals are sometimes losing their jobs or being overlooked for promotion because of woke. Our children are being taught false history and lies because of woke. Our children are not being taught the fundamentals of Western knowledge and enlightenment because of woke, and they will be the poorer for it. In some remote communities, Aboriginal children are being forced to live lives of terror and abuse in totally dysfunctional homes and communities because of woke. The young men and women of this country, one of the greatest, fairest, most equal, most generous nations on earth, have been taught to feel shame, guilt and self-loathing because of woke. You, you don't like Australia as a country at all? No, not at all. You, you live here? Yeah, 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 but I think it's a racist country. It's a racist state. Okay, uh, for, for me, as a migrant, I'm really happy I'm here. Okay. That's uh, very interesting for me to hear that someone that lives here actually does not like the country. Yeah, well, I think Australia is really racist against migrants as well. I think it like, you know, you see, see liberal politicians whipping up anti-migrant hysteria all, this, all, the, all the time. So why does it affect you so strongly? Well, because I'm against, I'm against racism, I'm against, against oppression. Have you experienced racism? Well, no, but that doesn't mean that I can't be against it. No, I, I'm not saying you shouldn't, you should. But uh, I'm just saying, how does it fire you up so much? Well, because it's f why wouldn't I be against it? So would you consider moving elsewhere? No, because I think we should fight racism. I think we should fight uh, oppression and uh, inequality, yeah. Uh, j just playing devil's advocate here, if you hate the country or don't like it, there are countries where there won't be racism. No, there's not. There's no countries without racism. Well, no, because racism is called by capitalism. Yeah, and capital we have to overthrow capitalism to get rid of it, to get rid of racism. And what we'll start a socialist society? Anyway, I'm busy, so I'm... No, I'm fascinated. I really, really want to, like, dive deep into this because that's a, such an interesting point of view. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, I can kind of tell that you're just trying to waste my time, actually, and I'm, I've got stuff to do. So. I'm not at all. Not at all wasting your time. Like, your, your opinions will probably be mirrored by other people. I, I hope, or, or challenged by other people. Yeah. Do you want the opinion to be challenged? I'm like actually not really interested. Okay. I'm actually not here to, yeah, I'm here to... Fly? Yeah. Okay, take care. See ya. Slow clap to the Australian <laughs> education system. Great job, guys. Inarticulate, <laughs> illogical, 
unable to mount an argument or even understand his, or is it her, I don't know, own point of view. I say he, but maybe it was she, I don't know, I don't care. But that is what the Australian education system has done to the young people of our nation. And I presume that kefir around his neck was to signal his support for Hamas, the most barbaric and evil rapists, racists and abusers of human rights you will ever find. What a joke. Thank you, woke. And speaking of jokes and indeed stand-up comedians, <laughs> it's hard to go past this fool. The same bloke who has a fondness for ruining a perfectly good suit by wandering into the shallows to prove that the planet is sinking thanks to the era of global boiling. <laughs> Take it away, Antonio. When uh, there were uh, indications that Hamas had infiltrated UNRWA, I acted immediately in order to guarantee that uh, we do whatever is necessary for UNRWA to be able to avoid any kind of infiltration by uh, uh, Hamas. Uh Really? No. You acted immediately, Antonio. I think you'll find the UN is about 75 years too late in stopping UNWA being infiltrated. But anyway, more about that with our next guest in a second. Last week in London, this vile creature, Paul Curry, who, to borrow a phrase from Barry Humphreys, identifies as a comedian, <laughs> turned his show in Soho into a grotesque anti-Semitic rant against Jew Jews. Curry whose act involves waving a Palestinian flag. Oh, that's always such a funny gag, isn't it? Hounded a Jewish man out of this show by abusing and swearing at him and urged the crowd to taunt him for not supporting Curry's calls for a ceasefire in Gaza. Absolutely despicable. Yet this theatre in Soho claimed was free speech. So there you have it. In the UK, you can't disrespect protected woke categories, but you can incite an entire crowd to turn into a pogrom-styled lynch mob terrifying a young Jew. Yep, that's all just fine and dandy in the sinister world of woke. Paul Curry, incidentally, was due to speak at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival, but I gather they are now having second thoughts, as they should. The Melbourne Comedy Festival was the one, by the way, which cancelled its own founder, Barry Humphreys, and ditched its main award, the Barrys, because Barry had voiced his concerns about the cult of transgenderism. But who needs comedians mm. these days anyway when you have people like Admiral Rachel Levine, <laughs> the US Assistant Secretary for Health, who was sworn in in 2021 as the first transgender four-star officer in the United States history and who was just one of several individuals specifically chosen to meet Joe Biden's diversity and inclusion goals. They don't come any woker. Quote, May this appointment be the first of many more to come as we create a diverse and more inclusive future, Rachel Levine said on being appointed. Let's hope not, or certainly not, if this nonsense he, sorry, she, she whatever, spouted this week is going, is anything to go by. Have a listen to the latest amazing scientific insights from this top health official. <sighs> earlier this woke, I mean earlier this week, have a listen. Hello, I'm Admiral Rachel Levine. This Black History Month, I'm pleased to partner with OMH in advancing better health through better understanding for black communities. Climate change is having a disproportionate effect on the physical and mental health of black communities. Black Americans are more likely than white Americans to live in areas and housing that increase their susceptibility to climate-related health issues. And 65% of black Americans report feeling anxious about climate change's impact. Through our Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, and the Office of Environmental Justice, we're working with providers and community leaders to identify innovative approaches that empower communities to address the health consequences linked to climate change. The utter stupidity, duplicity, and sheer vacuousness of those comments beggars belief. Not a single tangible health policy idea or commitment, nothing concrete or meaningful, simply woke, abstract verbiage built on fraudulent and meaningless research. 65% of black communities are worried about the impacts of climate change. And so? So now the weather knows what the colour of your skin is. The woke world is a fantasy world where non-intellectual, wishful thinking, empty virtue signalling and 
fatuous political platitudes are stirred together in a toxic, destructive brew that is eating away at the heart and soul, and more importantly, the young minds of the West. How our enemies must be laughing at us. <laughs> Returning now to the war in Israel, to the shocking anti-Israel rhetoric coming from the UN. The UN doesn't seem to like Israel very much, and even some of the UN's top officials have sided with Hamas when questioned. Joining us now to discuss further is Haviv Rati Gur, senior analyst at the Times of Israel, and now visiting Australia. Welcome. Haviv, great to have you here. Hope you are enjoying our country. It's a beautiful country. <laughs> it's nice to be in summer. Excellent. Now, we've been talking about Anwar. Uh, you've looked into the Han Anwar and their links with terrorism going back through the decades. I referred to that earlier. Tell us a little bit about what UNRWA really is and, and this issue of what is a refugee? Yeah, UNRWA is really two different things. It is a humanitarian aid organization that we absolutely need. There's just one little problem. Since it was founded in 1949 as a special refugee organization separate from the global international UNHCR, it deals only with Palestinian refugees, and it has a special definition for what a refugee is. So if you're a refugee because of some terrible circumstances, you're the Rohingya fleeing uh, the regime in Myanmar, you are under the UNHCR, and the UNHCR's main goal is to resettle you, to find you a place, to find you a citizenship, to find you work, to find you a home. And so UNHCR has done a fantastic job with 100 million refugees in the 20th century, of making them no longer refugees. UNRWA has the opposite mandate. Only under the UNRWA rules do the children of refugees continue to be refugees. And the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren, you now have four or five generations in places like Lebanon and Jordan of Palestinian refugees, which because they are still defined as refugees by UNRWA and because they are continuing to be fed by UNRWA and clothed by UNRWA and housed by UNRWA, the Jordanian state, the Lebanese state, the Syrian state don't have to take care of these people because they're not Syrians, just because they've been born in Syria for four generations. They're Palestinian refugees. You have a ridiculous um, situation in places like, for example, Jordan, where two million people who have been given citizenship by Jordan, they are Jordanian citizens living in Jordan, they're still Palestinian refugees under UNRWA rules. And so the goal is to make more refugees with every generation. They started with 700,000 in the 48-49 war, and they're now well past 5.5 million. It's the only refugee agency in the world that produces more refugees as time goes on. <laughs> right. Well, there's a funding model for that. So you're telling me someone, say, like a Bella Hadid, who's a supermodel, whose father's a billionaire, she's considered a refugee under this definition? Her specific story I don't know, I have to tell you, that technically... Um, in UNRWA's founding decision by the UN General Assembly in 1949, um, there is this legal definition of a refugee. You have to have lived in Palestine from 46 to 48 and been displaced by the war. Incidentally, quite a few Jews count under that category. Not a single one of them are a refugee under UNRWA rules. But, um, but you have to have that. Now, then there's a little stipulation in, those, in that General Assembly decision that also anyone UNRWA thinks needs help. Mm. So <laughs> that has been expanded to me. Um, anyone adopted by us. So a Jordanian citizen who technically is a refugee, but is a Jordanian citizen who owns land and a business and might be doing quite well in Jordan and adopts a child, not even by a lot, that child is now officially a refugee under UNRWA. So why and is explain, you... explain the, 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 the financing, because that's the heart of it, isn't it? There's all this money. When you say they clothe, feed, etc. There's money going. So this organisation has ballooned with billions of millions of refugees from, from a few hundred thousand. Equally, the money has ballooned. Right. There is a deep logic to all of it. Um, UNRWA funnels something like $1.1 billion a year just to its operation in Gaza. What's, what the, the logic is as follows, and it's a logic you find across the Palestinian activist world. The Palestinian, through UNRWA, the world, the international community, it's literally a General Assembly decision. The only way to change UNRWA or disband UNRWA is another General Assembly decision. The world is essentially saying that either the Palestinians remain refugees forever for all time, no matter where they go or what they do, or starve. UNRWA itself, 
which bills itself as a humanitarian aid organization to help Palestinians, in fact holds Palestinians hostage mm. to an ideology that says you return to your former home and displace Israel, you reverse history, you reverse 1948. So, for example, roughly three-quarters of Gaza's civilian population are refugees. Now, this is a Palestinian place in historic Palestine. That's how Palestinians refer to it. Under Palestinian rule, and they're Palestinian refugees, and it's most of the population. And the point is, why are they refugees in Gaza? Because they should be in Tel Aviv. They should be in Haifa. They should be going back to... So it is holding Palestinians hostage to the idea that you still need, 75 years later, to remove Israel, destroy Israel, erase that historic sin. Sure, but, I mean, let's also talk about the other thing besides the finance and the ideology. That's the, that's the UNRWA's ties to Hamas. And let's talk about what the head of the UN Relief Agency has said about Hamas and, you know, the role that we have seen with Hamas uh, and UNRWA people and UNRWA employees alleged to be involved even in the holding of hostages. This seems like they're not just, you know, uh, an aid organization. They're, they're accessories to terrorism. Talk us through this. <laughs> it's you know, what's frustrating is that this horrible thing that the world now is suddenly paying attention to, it, we've seen the U.S. willing to cut funding over this. This is small potatoes. This isn't the deep problem. The deep problem is that they're holding the entire Palestinian population hostage. But mm. it's much, even this point is much worse than it looks. In Gaza, um, UNRWA has 13,000 employees, literal employees, direct employees. These are UN employees. They are paid by the UN. They are under the UN auspices. You cannot get that job unless Hamas is okay with it. Obviously. Mm. Hamas runs the place. They're a mafia. That doesn't mean that every UNRWA employee in Gaza is Hamas. Not at all. But anybody who Hamas doesn't want to have that job can't have that job. Mm. And many people who, have, who work for UNRWA, simply Hamas is the, only, is the only reason they're allowed to. So of course they're profoundly... By the way, that's not even UNRWA's fault. That's just Hamas. If the World Food Program replaces UNRWA in Gaza, they'll become infiltrated by Hamas. They're the mafia running the place, and they run it violently and brutally. So the idea that you can run in UNRWA without it, the best way to, to bring aid into Gaza is to have a multiplicity of organizations with a deep, deep oversight by the international community. And you know why you can't? Do that, because the UN won't let you. If you go into the 1951 convention, the refugee convention that established the UNHCR, Article 1D literally prohibits the UNHCR from operating where UNRWA operates. In other words, the UN's own, the General Assembly's own decisions literally say to Palestinians, you either sustain this ideology of you being permanent forever refugees until the removal of Israel, or you start. So so what we're, sorry, Jen. So what we're doing is we're basically... Countries like Australia and so many countries are funding hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars eventually, into an organisation whose sole job is to force five million individuals, roughly, to return and replace, get rid of Israel and set up... Power. That's what we're funding. That's what all the countries around... If we're funding UNWA, we are funding the ideology that says we must return from the river to sea, we must kick it out is, Israel. That's it what is, we're doing. We're funding perpetual crisis. It is the foundational ideology of UNRWA and it is the reason they have this absolutely unique definition of refugee that exists for no other refugee group in the world, including Jews, who are millions of refugees in the 20th century. Not one of them is a refugee today because they operate under UNHCR definitions. Absolutely, and I'll say more than that. They, the, the, the horror of it isn't what it's doing to Israel. It's what it's doing to Palestinians. Because they need that aid. And they, that aid is dependent on them sticking to a story in which they have to be in a permanent war to regain a homeland that displaces millions of other people. And so it's, it's, it's as horrific and monstrous as you can imagine. And the, the idea that some Hamas people penetrated UNRWA's ranks well, is the tiniest little tip of the iceberg. But again, so Hamas themselves are not responsible for looking after these individuals, are they? That's because UNWA is feeding them, clothing them, doing it. So, so how does the economics within Gaza itself work? For 17 years, Hamas has ruled Gaza. And it built nothing in Gaza except those tunnels. 
It built nothing in Gaza except a tunnel network roughly 150% the size of the London tube system. And the sole purpose of those tunnels is to down the road start a war in which Palestinian civilians are, are massively hurt while Hamas hides in the tunnels. Now we know that. Until October 7, we thought they were deterred. We thought they were playing games. They were not playing games. The reason Hamas could control a territory for 17 years, tax Gazans, and bend the entire Gazan economy to the construction of this immense, immense project, turning Gaza into this enormous battlefield for a war they were planning to start, is that UNRWA took care of the schools, is that UNRWA took care of the food, is that UNRWA took care of the clinics. UNRWA, and that's the classic welfare problem. And it's a classic problem of international aid. International aid is important, it's necessary. It always, everywhere, risks becoming a, a, just a welfare dependency. In, in Hamas's case in Gaza, that was strategic, and it liberated Hamas to drag Gaza into permanent war. Which we help finance. Australian taxpayers and many other taxpayers. Haviv, great to chat to you. Uh, yes. Read you in the Times of Israel, senior political analyst there. Uh, thanks so much and enjoy your time in Australia. Great Thank to you. have you here. Coming up, lots more. James's donkey vote in a tick. Welcome back to the program. I'm James Morrow and you're watching Outsiders with Rowan Dean and Rita Panahi. And I tell you what, it's been a pretty scary week as far as Russia is concerned. First, there was that report that Russia was developing some sort of scary new space weapon, something that was so dangerous that there were calls for intelligence on it to be declassified for Congress. Just before the House votes on a massive foreign aid package, coincidentally. And then there was news that jailed Russian anti-Putin opposition figure Alexei Navalny was found dead in a Russian jail, presumably, it's pretty safe to say, with Vladimir Putin's henchmen responsible for his death. Well, happily, in these troubled and dangerous times, <laughs> the U.S. has a strong leader <laughs> in Joe Biden who is ready to articulately stand up to the Ruskies. Uh, almost over $4 billion. Four billion. Wow. We've done all the things. Boiler chickens. Yes, yes, yes. Because we've got that spirit. Whole lot of boiler chickens. Yeah. Boiler chickens. Okay, uh, maybe not. But at least the U.S. government never uses the legal system to try and jail oligarchs who fall <laughs> foul of the regime <laughs> like they do in Russia or use the courts to try and seize their fortunes, right? Oh, gosh, again. Maybe not. You see, a totally unbiased New York judge and a totally unbiased New York attorney general won a judgment this week for nearly half a billion, that's billion with a B dollars, against Donald Trump this week in what can only be called an entirely bogus, indeed fraudulent, fraud trial. Mm -hmm. Basically, the case driven by Attorney General Letitia James claimed this, that Donald Trump inflated the value of his assets to get loans to run his businesses. Loans which, by the way, he paid back uh, on time and in full and with interest. Now, banks didn't have a problem with this. The executives from banks such as Deutsche said that they, and they even testified in Trump's defense, saying they didn't feel aggrieved or victimized by the Trump organization. Just the opposite. They loaned him money, they paid it back, everybody won. But meanwhile, among the assets Trump is alleged to have inflated was his massive compound estate club Mar-a-Lago at Palm Beach. You see it there on the screen. An over 100-room income-earning club with more than 100 rooms, over 17 acres of beachfront on both sides of Palm Beach. And prosecutors said this, this property was worth only $18 million. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> come on, forget Sydney. That sort of money could barely buy you a parking space in Palm Beach, where the average house price is $5 million. So this was, let's be clear, nothing more than a third world hit job on Trump for the crime, not of fraud, but of being Trump and threatening the Democrat regime's hold on power. You know, Stalin's infamous henchman, Lavrenti Beria, used to say, show me the man and I'll show you the crime. And mm. that is really pretty much the inspiration for Letitia James, the attorney general who ran the case 
and who, ran, who, when she ran for office, made taking down Trump a central part of her campaign. I will never be afraid to challenge this illegitimate president. He should be charged with obstructing justice. I believe that the president of these United States can be indicted for criminal offenses. I will be shining a bright light <laughs> into every dark corner of his real estate dealings. truthfulness at every turn. Whoa. Yeah, so she pretty much had her mind made up before she even took office. And who can forget the smug smirk trial judge Arthur Engeron gave at the start of the trial? That's the problem, is that, you know, you have James now being sh shown in the background, you've got Trump in the foreground, and it fulfills the narrative on both sides. Trump is likely right. Pretty happy with himself there, and just goes to show the fix was in from the start. There was no way Trump was going to win in this fraud trial. Yet, and let's be clear, a man has been convicted in a civil trial for fraud for the crime of paying back loans with interest to banks that wanted to do more business with him. This is what happens when a justice system catches a bad case of Trump derangement syndrome. And the same thing's been going on down in Georgia, where a grand jury indicted Trump last year for election interference. By the way, this, in case you forgot, here's the foreperson of the grand jury that indicted Trump in that case. I wanted to hear from the former president, but honestly, I kind of wanted to subpoena the former president because I got to swear everybody in. And so I thought it'd be really cool to get 60 seconds with President Trump of me looking at him and being like, do you solemnly swear? And me getting to swear him in? I just, I kind of just thought that would be an awesome moment. Wow, how cool is that? Mm. She got to swear in Trump. <laughs> But that's nothing compared to, <laughs> compared to the district attorney, Fonnie Willis, who ran that case, and her special prosecutor lover, Nathan Wade, who decided they were going to get Trump on election interference charges. And now find themselves, I love this one, in hot water for a secret relationship they had that involved Fonnie Willis hiring Wade and paying him over $700,000 in taxpayer dollars to run the case while also going on secret trips and cruises on a corporate credit card, which Wade would then pay Willis back for in cash. It was all very complicated. And by the way, there was more. Also has come out that Wade secretly met at least twice with the Biden White House about the charges against Trump and colluded with the January 6th committee investigating the 2021 insurrection. <laughs> Funny, Willis is very likely to be removed from the case as DA, and if so... The Georgia interference case against Trump is likely to completely fall apart. But of course, there's other cases that are running against him elsewhere, and it all just goes to show how the people who hate Trump and they love to do this, they have to claim that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy and norms and the constitutional order. Well, it turns out they're often a whole lot worse at all of this stuff themselves. Fantastic. Thanks, James. And as we were saying at the beginning of this show, Rita, James and I don't think that's not coming here when you have now judges are going to be appointed because of diversity and inclusion and not on merit. So get ready for our justice system to be corrupted as well. Um, hmm. Ridiculous heritage laws have struck again. In a WA real estate agent could face jail time for building a creek crossing on his own property. We talked a lot about this during The Voice. Well, it's still going on. Joining us now is the accused, Tony Maddox, live from Perth. Tony, uh, welcome to Outsiders. Good to see you. Now, tell us the story here. What uh, about your creek, your crossing, and uh, how you could wind up in jail? Yeah, well, it's been a, uh, it's been a year long journey. But last year, last January, I was approached by uh, the Department of Aboriginal, of, um, not Affairs, Aboriginal Heritage Act, um, who just rang me and said, Tone, you've, uh, you've broken the act. We want to investigate you. They um, came out to the farm 
and um, we sat down together and they investigated me and asked me all these questions. Um, and one of the main questions they said, why didn't you ask us for permission to do this on your farm? And my response to them was simply, I've been here in this town in 2J for 40 years. Um, I've lived here. I've sold real estate in the town for 33 of those 40 years. I'm actually an electrician, but I went into real estate because my back's crook. So um, I've been selling real estate for 33 years. So why don't I know you even exist? Why don't I know the Aboriginal Heritage Act exists? Why haven't I been told? Why haven't I been taught it? And surely if I have a, a duty of care to ask you for permission, then don't you have a duty of care to tell me that you even exist? It, uh, it, blew me. it took me by surprise and I had no idea that my creek was covered under the Aboriginal Heritage Act. Had I had an idea, I would have asked them, simple. I did make um, preliminary inquiries before we worked on the crossing. The crossing's been there for 70 years. Um, my neighbour had it for... He'd lived there for 66 years. I've had it for 11 years. Um, I bought the farm from a neighbour. He was like my dad. So the crossing's been there an awful long time. We've driven across it for all those years uh, with no problems at all. Um, and he was totally unaware there was any Aboriginal heritage on his own farm, which, again, ask, you've got to ask the question, well, why? Why didn't he know? And it was an interesting thing. And then once I started asking around, nobody knew this Aboriginal Heritage Act applied to their properties. Absolutely nobody. So I would, I suggested to the um, investigators, instead of prosecution, wouldn't education be uh, more beneficial to the community than a prosecution? It, it, uh, it took me by surprise. But they issued me the summons and um, here we are a year later, um, due to go to court this Thursday. Um, I've now employed a barrister, a lawyer and a barrister. The costs are going through the roof. And you've got to ask the question, what for? What outcome, it, for, for, for what outcome? And the amazing part about the actual act when you go into the act is there is no um, outcome that says I must reclaim the area. Um, so they have no but power Tony, to make Tony, them remove the group. You, you don't even have, from what I understand, any of the local mm. elders who are aggrieved with what you've done. I've, I've, I don't know if we've got some pictures to show of the, the, the little uh, path you have built across this creek yep. so you can uh, drive your car because it was kept getting washed out. So you've just... Uh, uh, yes. And the local Indigenous community, you've spoken with them. Are, are, are any of them yes. aggrieved? Did any of them make a complaint <laughs> to the bureaucrats who've then taken this action? Good question. <laughs> Not one. In fact, they've all supported me. All our local elders are in support of what I've done. They all reckon I've done a fantastic job. The wildlife have come back to the creek now. There's permanent water there. I pump water from my own bore into the creek to keep it full. Otherwise, it would be a dry, sandy creek bed. And turtles have come back. The fish have come back. The wildlife, the birds are back. I've got kingfishers, I've got spoonbills, the, all the... There's, Last count, there was 110 ducks now reside on that little creek that I've now pumped water into. So I've actually brought water and life back into the creek. So all the local elders reckon I've done a fantastic job. And I can tell, tell you how many of those were consulted by this department. Zero. So, wow. Tony, Not what, what is it? I'm just curious because we keep talking about this word heritage. What exactly is the mm. nature of the heritage <laughs> that you are alleged by this department to have disturbed? Mm. Another very good question. Um, when the Act first came into power in 1972, I could be wrong here, but from my research, there was about 40, prop uh, 40 properties that were listed under in 1972. I could be wrong there, so I might stand corrected. Today, there's 40,000 properties. Like, um, unbeknown to us, not just the, uh, the Swan River and the Avon River, which is a, the tributary into the Swan, the start of the Swan, um, every 
creek, every tributary that feeds into the Avon River is now covered under the Act. Oh. How that happened, when that happened, is certainly beyond but, me. But, but Tony, so just, just, but, but, just to, to, to James's point, what is the specific thing? Is there some paintings or rock? What, what is, is it none. that they're objecting to? No. The, these bureaucrats? So, There's absolutely... Absolutely what? nothing on my creek line at all that would indicate there's Aboriginal heritage there. In fact, what I have found out from the local elders since getting them involved in this, um, one of the local guys said, Tone, my mum and dad used to drink out of a well that's in front of your property. And the well was up in on the, the main Gamaling Road. They've, they've put the main Gamaling Road right across the top of the well. And interestingly enough, every year, the water bubbles out through the middle of the road. I was wondering why they've now dug a trench, main roads from the road into my paddock. And that water now seeps into my paddock when, it, when the creek, when the uh, well fills up. I didn't know there was a well there. Now, interestingly, if you look under their Aboriginal heritage map, that well's not even shown. Like, but they've shown my whole creek and everyone else's creek. Effectively, the creeks now that pass through just about every farmer's farm are now all covered under the Aboriginal Heritage Act. And if you read the regulations of that act, that's where the scary bit comes in. Um, the regulations state, and they're sitting right in front of me, and I'll read a couple of them for you. You can't cut, pick, pull, break, remove, take, injure, poison, strip or destroy any tree, shrub, herb, grass or part or other plant or part thereof, whether living or dead. So basically you can't even pick up a stick from, the, from your Unbelievable. own Unbelievable, Tony, we've just run... Creek. We, unbelievable. Uh, we've run out of time. I'm sorry, we could talk to you all day, but oh, I sorry. gather that uh, part of the problem <laughs> is, is, is the rainbow serpent, which is a um, part of the, uh, the uh, heritage problem that seems to have been disturbed. We'll leave it there, Tony. Uh, thanks. Good luck in your battles, and we'll uh, speak again soon. Uh, coming up, what's more? Canberra Clown Show, aptly in a tick. Roll up, roll up, step right this way. It's the greatest show on earth, the Canberra Clown Show and Al Bozo's Circus. Ladies and gentlemen, you won't believe your eyes as Albo this week managed to make an entire fleet of Taipan helicopters seen here in a leaked photo nestling quietly in a warehouse in Townsville. Poof! magically disappear. Now, that was a Ooh. clever sleight of hand, eh? Just like that. And where will those magnificent pieces of military hardware eventually turn up? Here in Ukraine, perhaps, where they might have been of some use to the embattled locals? No, of course not. Or in some impoverished third world country, perhaps, where they could have been put to good use transporting much needed food supplies around. Don't be silly. No, according to the ABC, the Australian Army's Taipan helicopters have now been dismantled and are awaiting burial. Yes, they are going to bury the aircraft underground rather than donate them to the Ukraine or anyone, anywhere else. Quote, the Taipans were no longer in flying condition. I wonder why, and would require a huge expenditure of time and resources to get them back, said the government. Meanwhile, wonderful work in the Burley Griffin Big Top by Coalition Senator James Patterson in shining the spotlight on yet another member of the Labour Circus, sorry, Caucus, the ludicrous Minister for Clowning Around with Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Murray who? Sorry, I mean Murray where? No, no, my mistake. Murray what? That's it. What Murray seems to find a bit of a puzzle these days is telling the truth. He was caught out last week by Senator Patterson claiming that Peter Dutton had personally intervened to release a certain individual when he hadn't. Let's have a look and remember, as with all great clown shows, you've got to have the warm-up act first. In this case, ably performed by one of our senior Canberra public servants. I want to return to this issue of whether or not Peter Dutton, as Immigration Minister, intervened to personally grant a visa to NZYQ, as the Minister has asserted. Who was Minister for Immigration then? I think it was Scott Morrison. Correct. Neither of those people are Peter Dutton, are they? Uh, no. But in any case, Mr Dutton did not personally intervene to grant a visa to NZYQ at any point, did he? Uh, 
Not, not on those two occasions, Senator. I'm just, look, I'm just looking through the record I have here. <laughs> ah, don't they make you so proud, our wonderful public servants, earning a fortune, by the way, as they bumble around and trip all over themselves. Classic stuff. But wait for the punchline. Um, what, what I said, Senator Patterson, was that it was Mr Dutton, as the minister, who lifted the bar that would have otherwise prevented NZYQ from applying for a visa. That's not what you said. I'll quote you directly from uh, the transcript. Let's not forget that NZYQ, the case that went to the High Court, was a case in which the Leader of the Opposition personally intervened to grant the plaintiff a visa. You said that about half an hour ago. Well, and then I further made the, repeated the words that I've just said. Right. So your statement, which you just defended 15 minutes ago, was wrong. He didn't intervene to grant I'm not, a visa. I'm not resiling from anything I've said. Well, that reflects on you, Minister. Indeed it does, and it reflects on the entire Albanese clown show. Bravo to Senator James Patterson. And what a joke the Queensland Labor senator is. Murray who? Murray what? Murray where? And Murray, why do we even employ this joker? Now, let's check out Labor's travelling circus. And this week, the circus is in Melbourne town, where former UK train spotter, and this would be genuinely funny if it weren't so tragic, former Victorian COVID commander, Jerome Weimar, this week proved the gravity-defying theory of left-wing public service. The more useless you are, the higher you fly. This week, the man who lorded it over the world's longest and most draconian COVID response has now been made head of the Victorian government's grand housing policy. Well, Radio 3AW's Tom Elliott was among the many Victorians who failed to see the funny side. Let's just consider Jerome Weimar's recent career. 2015 to 2020, he ran Public Transport Victoria. Now, that was a time when the whole Mikey system was an utter debacle, which it still is. Uh, he was largely responsible for that. During the COVID years, August 2020 to June 2022, he was in charge of the state government's COVID-19 response. Now, that was an utter debacle here. Everything that happened was wrong. The Victorian government's COVID response, it was done badly, and Jerome Weimar was in charge. And then when that finished, he was put in charge of the Commonwealth Games. The state government suddenly found out that the cost of it was going to be much higher than what they budgeted for. As a result, they canned the whole thing and they made Melbourne or Victoria the laughing stock of, of, of the Commonwealth world. Indeed. Well, Tom, you've got a point there. But remember, Jerome was never a solo act. He was always part of the Dan Andrews troupe, the comedy trio who made Melbourne the laughing stock of the entire planet. Who can ever forget their greatest hits? What's this? An ultrasound in an hour yeah, pregnant. she's pregnant. What the are you doing? What the are you doing? Classy work there, Jerome. And if you need a copy of those clips for your CV, just let me know. But of course, you can't keep a good clown down these days. And this week's Clown of the Week award has to go to our favourite energy and climate change bozo. Sorry, Minister Chris Bowen, as we discussed earlier in the show. As one fan of the show wrote on Twitter, 500,000 homes are without, without power due to the collapse of Loy Yang A power station. AEMO wholesale price went to the maximum price of $16,600 per megawatt hour. You voted Labor, Victoria, and this is what you get with climate zealotry. Or as another wag put it, people can't complain about electricity prices if there's no electricity. Ba boom But let's leave the last word to the climate clown himself. Can you forecast a time when power prices will start to come down? Well, um, of course, power prices are 
are fluctuating internationally. There's a lot of pressure. Yes, we'll all be well out of pocket long after this circus has left town. What would Dwight Yoakam say? And it's a real sad place to hang around Inside the pocket of a clown Hyperbole, hyperbole, as Julia Gillard would say. Extreme exaggeration. Well, the woman was fired. Why? For doing a bad job? No, because... She didn't know how to use pronouns, Rita. Well, yes, this is after decades of volunteering for MS uh, non-profit. Uh, the non-profits have got to be very, very careful about going woke and becoming extremists in this area because they depend on the largesse of donations. Mm -hmm. and, and if people uh, have got a lot of places they could put their money, why would you give them a reason not to donate to you? This is just cruel. This poor woman has devoted so much of her life to this charity to be treated 90, like this. 90 years old. Well, and beyond that, it's not just, you know, about her being 90 years old. The idea that, you know, you're helping MS sufferers, you're trying to do research into this terrible condition, that somehow pronouns even enter into the equation is a joke. Yeah. And she didn't understand them. Disgrace. Woke is a complete joke. It's so dangerous. Someone who's against woke is someone we've talked about here a lot, Javier Mille, the president of Argentina. Have a look at him. While Albo is travelling up the pointy end of the plane and when he goes in his Commonwealth car, he can't use the phone. <laughs> Javier Mille, who's a true conservative hero, this is how a conservative behaves. Have a look. There you go. A true conservative hero, Harvey oh, Mille. An president extremist, of if you listen to the Western media. <laughs> a right wing <laughs> reactionary extremist that tried to say he's a fascist. I mean, the characterization of this man as some sort of Nazi. And where, where does he go? He goes to the Western Wall and, and yeah. he, you know, he's, he's a. a, a and he's going to tear down French all French. the bureaucracies. Uh, Rita Southwick. Yes, uh, Victorian Liberal uh, Deputy Leader David oh. Southwick has released this himself. Mm. David, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, well, you know, it's Swifty tonight. I've got the T-shirt. I couldn't get tickets, so I thought I'd have my own concert here in the office. Don't forget, shake it off. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, on that note, I think we'll say, and he's going to be the new leader replacing prosciutto. That's it. See you next Sunday, 9 a.m. here for Outsiders. Have a great week. Don't forget James, 11 o'clock on Friday, <laughs> yeah, 8 o'clock on Friday, Rita, 11 o'clock Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We'll see you next Sunday. Goodbye. <laughs>